Okay, I found my board. I'm back. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, we were talking about Turo. Turo is sort of the Airbnb for cars, but there's been a lot going on. And so Turo's been around for a while. Uh, this wasn't the original brand name. They changed the brand name about six, seven years ago. But nonetheless, we know them as open up the app, Airbnb for cars. Find one you like, find it in your zip code, your city, make an appointment, make sure you have a valid driver's license, insurance, and a credit card that works. Bingo, you're renting somebody's car. Meet them over at the service station or the mall or wherever it is. Swap the keys, you're on your way. What's interesting is they've had an IPO that's been coming soon for two years. That's right. In 2022, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing service Turo Fi, so go public. But the company is, by the way, what, I like to thank Bloomberg for the help. If you were working for Turo and it says, the company has lost a total of $544 million, half a billion dollars since 2012. Yeah, thanks for the help. You know, and that's January 11th, 2022. So this is a little over two years ago because we are now in late February of 24. That was the first headline. Oh, and then we have this one. I'll lean back here. Turo just dropped its 2022 financials that says IPO hunt continues. March of 2023, uh, TechCrunch picked that up. So this is a year later, they still haven't gone public and now they've just dropped their, their 22 financials so that you could read them because if you're gonna go public, www.scc.gov and you could look for S1. So don't do it now, but later you could search for Turo S1 at www.scc.gov and they have to show you everything. It's law and it's a really fun read. You can see what the executives make, you see what they say about the risk and you find financial data. Then, okay, here we go. March, now we go to June, 2023. Turo's quarterly revenue rose 30%, but losses widen, car sharing company says an IPO filing tweak. They tweak the IPO filing. That's the S1 that you can read at www.sec.gov. And there's the original one right here. So now we're over, uh, coming up on a year and a half into it. Car sharing service Turo restarts IPO plans for fall 2023. Okay, look at this. <laughs> service Turo dot, dot, dot restarts plans for IPO. So in other words, the market, Bloomberg, Market Watch, TechCrunch are losing patience. They normally see, hey, S1's at SEC.gov, go read it, they're going public. And it's usually like a six month dance. Then the last three months are completely quiet in the quiet period, there's things that go on and they're out on the stock market, people ringing a bell, smiling in suits, confetti and everything, all that stuff going on, it hadn't happened yet. This is my favorite one. This year, Crunchbase, January 3rd, 2024, five weeks ago. This is an authentic, real live headline. Forecast, 15 companies we think may actually, really, finally, maybe go public in 2024. How humiliating is that? This is a big deal. There's regulations and laws governing people going public. Your company's gonna go out. They wanna protect the public, but also known as the retail buyer, the retail trader, the retail investor. They wanna protect them. That's what this whole IPO process is about with sec.gov regulating it. But there's no regulation on the business media. They can get as tweak. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Actually, really, finally, maybe. They can be as sarcastic as they want. So what led to this? I, I think some of this is being kind of hard on Turo because they were coming out right here. So let's go dive in and see, go back in history because I am not hard on Turo the way these guys are. I actually think this is a great story that's just taken a while to come to market. And maybe it wasn't the best of timing coming out of COVID, seeing if it was gonna do, because I happened to, to believe what I've read that this was a little bit of a COVID pullback because the bounce out hadn't really happened yet. Remember, we're talking about January of 2022. Some states I think were still closed because the bounce member happened that spring. So here we go. Where it began, Q Neil Diamond, Sweet Caroline. It was founded as Relay Rides by this guy, Shelby Clark, and Tara Reeves and Nabil Al-Qadi. Now, I don't find much written about them, but I found two articles that name these folks as co-founders, but I only find Shelby Clark talked about going forward. So I'm including all of this for the sake of 
I don't know which is exactly correct because there's a number of presentations. So let's just say that they were co-founders. These two stepped aside. They had all met at Harvard and they co-founded the company back then. And they said, hey, what if we had a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing kind of like Airbnb? So they're sitting there at Harvard Business School, pretty smart kids, some pretty smart people. And 2010, Relay Rides was born. The company expanded to San Francisco, which became the headquarters, and they went out there looking for investment. Well, what they also happened in 2011, Mr. Andre Haddad was named CEO. Now, this guy's a pretty sharp guy. He had been part of past successes, former CEO of Shopping.com. Sorry for the typo. X shouldn't be there. That's CEO. My bad. Anyway, he became the CEO, and away they go, and here you have it. Airbnb for cars is born. You can see there's your map, you set your filters. What are you looking for? Hey, there's a Tesla Model X, you know, the one with the wings that come up. Put all your kids and everybody in there. All right, um, here's a Jeep Wrangler. You find what you want, how much per day, and you make plans to go pick it up. As long as you've got a valid driver's license, insurance validation, a few other things in here, you're ready to go rent on Turo, Airbnb for cars. Buyers, sellers, owners, renters. Pretty simple, and away we go. So they made pretty steady progress. So let's go. They would raise, and I'm going to leave out all the venture rounds here. I'm going to summarize it up. They would raise over half a billion dollars over this time. But the first 52 came from Canaan Partners, Google Ventures, that would also get into the driverless car. So they were very interested in this. Shasta, Trinity, August Capital. These guys aren't going to like what I'm about to say, but they were second and third tier, which is still strong venture capital companies. Now, when I say first tier, I'm talking about Benchmark. I'm talking about Sequoia. I'm talking about Kleiner Perkins. First tier. So when I call these guys third tier, I'm really just talking levels of highly qualified venture capital firms. 2010 to 2014, 52 and a half million dollars. So in other words, real dollars, an experienced CEO that came from shopping.com, and away we go. 2015, they changed the name to Turo. There's the branding. Um, changed the name for Turo, and they have a long, drawn-out explanation of what that means. It really doesn't matter what it means, because when you select an odd name, Yahoo, Twitter, Turo, it doesn't really mean anything until you define it as something, and then it means that forever. Twitter meant messaging forever once it was in trash. Turo means car. Airbnb is like, that is a play on bed and breakfast and kind of connected, kind of somehow kind of descriptive. This is one of those brands where you can get together in a room, you know, have a couple bong hits and talk about all the things that, that go into the brand name. What it just means is once you train people what Turo meant, it meant Airbnb for cars. So they changed their name. Then Forbes included it in the 14th hottest on-demand startups in 2015, and it was all the way up to 311 million. So in other words, it had gotten traction, real traction. See, it's not building software here hoping that the software is going to work, hoping that there's going to be product market fit. There is product market fit. It was called Hertz and Avis, and they're taking Airbnb to it. Just like Airbnb said, hey, we could be the largest hotel chain in America someday. These guys were like, hey, we could replace all that. The world's idle cars could be the Hertz and Avis that everybody can use, and we're going to make it happen. That's exactly what's here. So without the need for that, with that, that first segment of product market fit, because you have a pretty good idea it's working, you have a $311 million valuation. Fantastic. Good work. And then, so 2016, 2017, just like Airbnb, just like Lyft, they have to launch regionally. Why? Turo, available now in Los Angeles, and then sit back and do a lot of seed to get people to put the cars there. Because until my car is there for you to rent for a day, there's no business. So Turo was launching in individual territories with a lot of fanfare. Hey, you have a car? You've got good insurance? You want to rent it? Oh, you have a Jeep? Fantastic. Great condition and good shape. People would love to take your Jeep out to the edge of the desert for a day. Why don't you let them do it with Turo? And all of a sudden people said, hey, you know what? Maybe I'll do that. Boom. Now you've got cars. Then buyers are like, be great if I could get a Jeep and go to the desert. Hey, there's one there for $109 a day. Hey, honey, for 250 bucks with tax and everything, we could take this a Jeep and go out to the edge of the desert and go camping. Hey, that's great. Let's go do that. Boom. 
Now Toro is available in each new market. So they had to go through that cultivation and excitement period to, to and raising excitement period to get people say, hey, you know what? I'm going to put my car in there. And now there is a library of cars. Boom. There's something to go rent. So in 2016-17, launched in Canada, specifically Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec. Uh, there's some larger cities there. Uh, you've got uh, Calgary in Alberta, Quebec, we know Montreal is there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And believe it or not, they also launched in the United Kingdom. So in given areas. So what are they proving here? And why do I bring those up? I bring those up because it proves that it had international global applicability. And guess what? They were right. Just like Lyft was right, just like Uber was right. But when Uber went to the UK, remember that created a fuss because UK has got some of the best taxi service in the world. Those taxis have to be up to a certain standard. Drivers have to take tests about knowledge of the area. You know, you go to New York City, the cab driver only has to be an air breathing mammal. You know, everywhere else you go, it's, it's a little sketchy like that. You go to the UK, you've seen those black cabs and the drivers. Polite, informed, they know exactly what you need to do. They know exactly where everything is, including like the newest restaurant. So when Uber went to the UK, you had a little bit of a fight there, but most everywhere else when they went, it just proved the model works. So too was Turo proving the model worked. So then they start adding technology and a big investor. Remember I told you about those initial investors? Great group of investors, great investors to have, but a big tier one investor would show up. So 2018, they said, hey, we're going to give you a device in your car that will, you plug it in and it'll unlock your car using the Turo app and it will provide GPS monitoring so you know where the hell your car is. So, you know, I haven't heard from my renter for a few days. Where, where's my car? So that you could figure that out because Turo had to deal with accidents, had to deal with theft. And this also allowed you to say, where are you? I'm in front of your car. Hey, read me the license number on the back. Bup, 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 bup. Okay, Boop. my car's unlocked. I've got a spare key in the center console. Oh, great, I'm on my way. So they were doing things to make it easier to rent and pick up and drop off. Then 2019, check this out. They went keyless entry into certain vehicles that they didn't even have to put the in-car devices. So now they're putting technology on this. You know, Airbnb doesn't put technology at your house. These guys invested in technology for the car to make the experience better. Airbnb is just builds a marketplace. And you gotta figure out who picks up the key, how do you let them into the house and things like that. But you don't have like a remote control necessarily to unlock your house. Now, I suppose if you have a digital door lock and something like that, you could probably do that at your home. But for cars, every one of them needed. And so Turo was investing in technology to make the experience seamless. Bravo, really smart stuff. Then, oh, Interactive Corp, IEC invested a quarter of a billion dollars and became the largest shareholder. That, my friend, is strategic player and big time validation. IEC has invested in a lot of media companies, a lot of entertainment, a lot of business enablement. Boom, here you are. IEC is now an investor to the tune of a quarter billion dollars. There you go. And they did something else. They updated the terms of service to say, if you rent with us, it's an exclusive relationship. You cannot put your car on any other car sharing service. Why? <clears throat> Here's why. People said, oh, they just want exclusivity. They're trying to screw with people. No, that's not why. And let me explain. The reason Turo did this, yes, you know, on one side of the house, the business people said, hey, we get exclusivity. We can lock up all these cars. People only come for us. We'll rule the world. Yeah, sure. But the other side of it is, what if you had your car with Turo and something else? And on something else, somebody rents that Jeep this morning. And you forget over here on Turo to go in there and go, oh, I got to go in here and take my Jeep off. Oh, no, someone just rented it. Now what? Now Turo's got a customer care problem. Hey man, I rented a Jeep from somebody and this guy's texting me telling me he got the email from Turo on the app saying he doesn't have it. I'm trying to pick this thing up in a couple hours. Now I got to go in there and I can't find anything that I want. Bingo. So Turo said, stop to, to protect the customer. 
and to protect the customer experience, Turo said, you gotta be exclusive to us. So while some people were coming out and saying, and this even went to court, oh, you know, you're just trying to do this to screw with people. No, we're not trying to do it to screw with people, protect the business. We're actually trying to protect the customer experience of the person renting the car. That if it says the car is there on Turo, the car is there unless it is stolen overnight or is just in a wreck. And those are exceptions. Hey, dude, I'm sorry, the car was stolen last night. The car was in a wreck, we gotta take it down. Boom, and I would understand. It's a pain in the neck and I'd be disappointed and frustrated, but I'd go rent something else. But if it's just not there because two competing service did it, I'm gonna be like, come on guys, get your act together. You can't do this to the customer, you know? So, boom, these terms of service, I think were smart. So they allowed people to protect the integrity of the relationship and the offering, it's on the app, meant that the inventory, that vehicle was available. And away we go. Then they go to COVID. And you'll find a bunch of charts out there where they had their issue with COVID, and we're gonna to get to those in a second. But in 2022, remember you got the IPO going out there. They said they had 165,000 active hosts of people or small businesses using the platform and 3 million guests booked 19 million days on Turo's platform. Let's take a look at that. 3 million guests booked 19 million days. That means that's not 19 million guests book three million, it's three million guests, 19 million days. That means that each guest was booking an average of six and a half days. Isn't that interesting? It's not one and done, which means you had repeat customers. This to me is not about the millions, it's about the ratio, which implies that there are repeat customers. Because a lot of people rent it for two days, like the, like the fictitious story I made up, the example, not really a fictitious story, people did it, needed a Jeep to go to the desert, in the spring or fall out there outside LA, go camping, wanted to take a Jeep. And so they turrowed one. There you go. Product market fit and repeat customer. That's loyalty, that shows recurrence of business. That's a good thing. So they announced that. <clears throat> Total investment, 502 million, funding 14 rounds. The biggest of which, half of that being IAC. Then you start to see this, saying, okay, well, it's very convenient for you, but being a Turo host, is that good for me? Can I, can I really make a buck being a Turo host? Let's go take a look. I found these. These are on YouTube, people talking about their own success stories, and I went, read through them, and I read through comments, and it doesn't appear to be like a made-up piece. It appears to be real Turo hosts talking about what they've gone through. This guy says he makes 200K a month from his fleet. And in his description in there, he was talking like, yeah, he's got 160 in cost for insurance and payments, but that means he's making money. This woman says that she and her husband have 200 cars, that they actually rent a small lot. So guess what? This is mini Avis wherever she lives. And I'm not gonna go into identifying specifics here, but check that out. Then these guys also, they said, we only do Teslas and we do 200 cars with Tesla. That's what they do. And why do they do 200 cars? Because it makes training, service, and everything easy because we only have one type of car. You know what that sounds like to me, ladies and gentlemen? Quick side note. Do you know why Southwest Airlines only has 737s? Number one, it worked for the routes they were flying, but number two, all the mechanics and spare parts are the same no matter where you go. It's not like, hey, I need somebody to work on this airplane. That What model is it? Oh, it's, it's a 757 extended range. Oh, I'm not checked out on that. And we don't have parts for that that you're looking for. No, so wherever Southwest had um, maintenance, it was all you needed, do we have mechanics here and do we have fully stocked parts? Yes. Well, then the answer was somebody could work on it. They didn't have to ask the model number of the airplane because Southwest, that was efficient. These guys are kind of taking that model here saying, we just rent Teslas. That way we know how to describe them. We know how to train them. People on the phone can tell people how to use it. It's very convenient. And these two guys claim to have 200 cars in a Tesla fleet. So not only is this good for people like you and me that want some special car, maybe a big car, um, my wife rented a Yukon Denali because my daughter had a high school golf tournament. She was going to have three other players in there. So it's one, two, three, four players. Oh, I said golf tournament out of town. So you had, you had five luggages and four sets of golf clubs. So we got the Denali XL. So you had all the space in the back. 
Bingo, there you go. So we did that and it worked really, really well. And we've rented with Turo a couple times. Uh, my wife went to Salt Lake City, was driving up to Twin Falls, Idaho. Rented there on Turo back and forth in a nicer car, a more comfortable, and I, me picking it, safer ride for my family at one half the cost of Hertz or Avis. Yes, one half the cost. Are you listening, Hertz and Avis? So anyway, and it was fully insured and a good safe trip, everything else. So you've got people that are renting things out and doing so very, very successfully. So it's not only good for the examples I just gave you from the BizDoc Babe really renting and doing things, but also for people that are making a business on the Turo platform. This is a platform play. So as we go to start talking about the IPO, let's talk about something here. Platform plays that enable exponential growth are very interesting because you can create a flywheel effect of revenue and net profit. Let's go check it out. Here's the financials. Now this is all we have because they're not public yet. And so they've only talked about like first quarter 23. All of this stuff needs to get updated on the S1 at, you can say it now, you've memorized it, www.sec.gov. And they're on version five of the updated S1 and they're only through Q1 of 23. So if they're really gonna go public, at some point in time, they gotta update all of 23 and go through the IPO process. I think they're gonna go out this year and I'll tell you why in a minute. So let's take a look here. 2019, remember this is right before COVID, 141 million, and they said they were growing pretty strong, but look, during COVID, they went to 149 million and they lost about 100 million both. When they have, this was really a COVID year, right? It was really COVID, COVID coming out. Look at that, 469 million, they lost 40. So we're heading in the right direction. Remember Lyft just recently said on the stock market that they are finally profitable. But look at these guys, 2022, 746 million, $154 million of profit. So 2022, so these are all going in the right direction. The loss reduces, it turns the corner and they're heading out. So if these financials stand up to scrutiny, which is what you're gonna get when you go public, then they appear to be on the right trend and we'll just see what they announced for 2023. It better be close to a billion and about 250. So remember I said that, I'm looking for 1 billion and 250. That's what I'm looking for. Um, on, when they update the uh, S1 to version six or version seven and disclose all of 2023, which they have to do if they're going public this year. So, IPO time. Let's talk about the IPO. Analyst, Bloomberg Second Measure. Pretty reputable company, I think. What do they think? They said, well, if they're gonna go public, let's compare them to Enterprise, Hertz, Avis Budget, and Turo. So if you look here, when they get started, look at this shape of this curve. It's following exactly the market impacts or the economic impact. But suddenly, suddenly you look at the growth, they've grown 400% for the year, law of small numbers I know, with only Avis and budget growing better and actually Hertz and Enterprise shrinking. I wonder why Hertz and Enterprise are shrinking. Could it be that there's a new player in town, just like Airbnb has impacted hotels? But it shows you, here's the market, there's COVID, you know, People are renting cars and then stay at home or you're arrested. So we have COVID and then we grow out of COVID and we have, you know, a bump last summer, you know, with what's going on. And finally we're out, but take a look at this. You can see this is following the market. So what does that mean? They're part of the market. They're not an isolated out player. They are part of the market. Then say, okay, well, what is the average monthly sale for Turo versus other car companies. So let's go take a look. Get around the startup, Avis budget, enterprise. And we compare this, the colors now become months, 19, 20, 21, 22, 19, 20, 21, 22. So Turo was a little bit down, but take a look at this. They are up over $450 a month from their customers. So Turo is getting more from its customers in 
gross monthly rental, and I know that's split with the host, you and me, if we rented out our Denali or our Tesla or something. But take a look at that. I mean, only Avis Budget and Enterprise are up at 400. They're over 450. You, you saw Hertz, you know, a little bit below. But isn't that interesting? Very interesting. Well, what they've been able to do. And by the way, who sets the pricing here? You and me. We set the pricing. We set it too high. Our car doesn't rent. We look around other cars similar, set a similar price. They select us because our car is nicer. It's the color they want or whatever. And the price is in range and it does it. So you've got Bloomberg second measure. Tip of the hat to the Bloomberg second measure people. Um, thank you for allowing us to use your numbers here and to talk about them and to give you full credit. But this all came out of their research analysis. You know what this says? The analysts see opportunity in Turo. They're following the market that we just saw. And here, they are actually get more per month per customer than the majors. Interesting stuff. So now we wait. <clears throat> and what does Forbes say? This is two weeks ago. Forbes, five best upcoming IPOs to watch in 2024. Skims, Plaid, Discord. We know Discord, that's the, uh, that's the messaging platform for games. Chime, and look at that. Turo, they anticipate a $3 billion IPO. We'll have to wait till it's updated on www.sec.gov. Go in there and check out that S1 and see what it is, but it's one to watch. And so should they update that and successfully go public with a lot of this increase that we're showing in revenue, uh, turning toward profit, more per month than the majors? Hey, hey, that sounds like a story you could sell on the stock market to say why you're going public and why you're going to generate value into the future. Well, we hope so. I happen to be a fan of the product, and I hope the underlying fundamentals inside the company and the leadership is up to the challenge of being Sarbox compliant and all the rest of the things you have to do these days before you uh, go out in your IPO so that you can represent true value for the investor the same way they've re represented really great value for hosts and users or guests. So now, what about you and me? So let's talk about some things. Blue Ocean, you can apply a known business model. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at what Turo did. Turo took the Airbnb business model, applied it, and is killing the majors. The majors have to buy a bunch of cars. Turo is like, what rents and what doesn't is going to be a fact of the market. Did the hosts put up cars that are clean and desirable? If they don't, that car will sit there and never rent. The market sorts itself out. We here at Toro just have to put it in place. Put the app in place and let the market sort out. Very interesting. But they applied Airbnb business model. Hey, you have good pictures, your place is clean, convenient, and nice, people are gonna rent it. If not, or if it's too high price, not so much. Next, scaling, one market at a time. Frequently people say, hey BizDoc, I'm gonna reach out to you on Minect, on the Minect app, and I got a question for you. How do I go nationwide with this thing? I'm like, wait, how do you first maybe do Insta ads and do ads on a regional basis, on a controlled spending basis, and prove that your ads work, and prove that it works here, then move to here, here, and here. I'm not saying go slow forever. I'm saying be sure you know before you go. Scaling one market at a time is a big lesson that we had here. And they just looked over their shoulder at Uber and Lyft and Airbnb, and they sort of followed best practices there. Technology, enhance your offering. I explained that there's only so much that Airbnb can do, but there's a lot that Lyft can do and Uber can do. Now you have ads in there, you have all sorts of other things you could do. You can add five stops on there, determine what direction you're going, even pick up food. So you could basically, if you had a couple hundred bucks, you could spend half a Saturday doing errands in the same Uber and be dropped off at your house and unpack everything. Well, similarly, Turo, um, puts technology in there for unlocking cars and other thing to make the experience. What can you do to enhance your offering? Even if you've got a basic website, maybe you don't have to go get a whole, um, you know, a app built. What can you do with text messaging? Let's say you're a landscaper and you got two trucks, 10 guys, and away you go. 
What if you just started using a text messaging service so you could tell everybody our crew will be there tomorrow to, as long as it doesn't rain and we're going to do your yard tomorrow as planned Wednesday. Or, hey, this week we'll be there on Thursday because Monday was Labor Day and everybody was off, so we're shifting one day this week. What if you just use text messaging for that and you send a text message after? Hey, we finished doing your lawn today. Please respond, one, if it all looks good, two, if you want the owner, me, to call you. So you can use technology to enhance your offering, and you don't need to build an app. There are things you can do to enhance it, and I think that's a lesson here. And lastly, patient. Doesn't mean you lack urgency, it just means that you're patient to be sure it's working so you can be urgent on the basis of facts. And I think these are all lessons for us. And I'm using the example of a landscaping company uh, because I want to show you how you can really learn and apply if you sit back and look at these things for even basic business. You could be a pool man. You could be a landscape. There's all kinds of things you could do to set yourself apart from others in your town. And that is this week's case study on Turo, as well as how you can apply what they've successfully done. So keep your eye on it. I'm keeping my eye on this one. Let's see if the IPO goes out. And when they announce 23, let's see if the biz doc's right about those numbers and it results in an IPO that maybe is worth you and I making our own individual decisions and buying into.